Education never stops. We're currently looking at ways to improve everything we can with our students. For Your Story One Heartbeat, I'm Greg Ellis, and today we are joined with Stuart McMillan, who is working on a District of Innovation process, addressing our needs, and meeting with our entire community. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, Greg. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and really to share more about our District of Innovation process and where we are. Um, really appreciated our One Heartbeat video um, earlier in the fall where we talked about District of Innovation in our timeline. And now really want to share that from September and through January, we've really been working to get feedback from the community on what are the greatest needs for the Tupelo Public School District. Um, and we're pleased we had 14 stakeholder meetings that Dr. Piku and I led um, to hear from students, from parents, from faculty, staff, and from community members. Across those 14 groups, we had 177 per people participate. And we also released a District of Innovation Comprehensive Needs Assessment Survey that we had 728 people take across those same groups of students, parents, faculty, staff, and community members. Um, so total, we got almost 900 people who participated in this process to give feedback um, and a wide range of individuals from across the community. The cross-section of the community is what's important, mm -hmm. you know. It's not just one group here, one group there. We want everybody's input because mm -hmm. it, it's our future through their kids mm -hmm. or and you don't even have to have kids in the school to participate. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that was something for me, once we got down to looking at the actual feedback and analyzing it, especially the top six greatest needs, um, the individuals across the spectrum, parents, students, faculty, staff, community members, really the greatest needs are the needs that everybody is seeing. Um, and that's something that as we look at the needs and you look at um, how we are sharing the actual groups that shared those needs it's just something to note that those higher prioritized needs that there are a representative there is a representative sampling across all groups that shared those needs let's dive into it so what did we learn <laughs> I like it so we the way that we structured the needs we have six identified needs that 30 percent um, to 49 percent of the groups prioritized um, so when I present these needs it is based on the number of of groups who shared these prioritized needs. Um, and then there's a second group um, that we had between 11 and 19 percent of the groups that shared, and that's the seven that are kind of the second tier of prioritized needs. Um, so starting off, our number one greatest identified need was achievement gap. Looking at how do we make sure we meet the needs of students in poverty, of students who have special education needs, and students who are English learners. Um, and and really focusing on creating targeted programs for those groups. Um, that was priority number one. There were 19 groups or 45% of the groups that shared that identified need. Did that surprise you as the number one need or were you like, okay, that's kind of what we were expecting? Um, I think that seeing the focus on meeting the needs of all kids, people probably think about those groups that might have been underserved in the past. So it wasn't really surprising to me um, to see that. I think it was validating um, and also to see that that was one that everyone seemed to share across those groups. A lot of students, parents, faculty, staff, and community members across both the in-person meetings and the survey. The second identified greatest need is staffing, making sure we're looking at our staffing structure, that we have the right supports in place, and looking at the diversity of our staff and trying to increase that diversity. Um, that priority number two had 17 groups or 40% that shared that need. Um, and a lot of emphasis, especially on the lower grade levels in particular. The third need that was identified is social emotional support. So we know that students coming into the classroom don't just come with academic needs, that they um, potentially have had adverse childhood experiences or experienced trauma or might be going through a rough time in their life. So making sure that we have wraparound services, that we have counseling supports, that we have structures to help meet the needs outside above and beyond the academic needs in the classroom um, was a high priority. And a lot of that is offered, we just got to expand mm -hmm, it as mm -hmm. 
you know, we it's something that you see a lot about on TV mm -hmm. with these kids, and, and everybody handles things differently, and mm -hmm. we want to make sure we have the trained staff mm -hmm. for that. Right. So specifically with trauma-informed care or dealing with adverse childhood experiences, that could look like better training for teachers related to that. Um, it could also look like staffing changes or additions or just looking at the current structure to make sure we're really meeting all of those needs. Can you kind of give them an example, just so everybody's clear, of, of an adverse uh, issue that a child may be mm -hmm. dealing with? Um, it could be something related to um, homelessness, losing a home for a certain reason. It could be related to abuse of some sort. It could be related to, to relationship dynamics, a divorce um, of parents, a, a loss of someone important, a loss of a grandparent. So there, that adverse childhood experiences runs the gamut of anything and everything, really just something negative that could happen to a child growing up. A sick parent that, mm -hmm. that that child goes to school during the mm -hmm. day, comes home, has to take care of mom or dad. Exactly. And we do. We have children that are caregivers, for right. lack of a better word, for aging parents or aging grandparents. Um, and that's a really difficult experience. Well, the next three are um, all have the same number of groups that voted for them. Um, and so these are not in a particular order. They are the second, the th three, four, and five, but they're all priority number four. Um, the first of those that I'll share is career-oriented pathways. So having clear plans from an early age of what are career options and opportunities, of focusing on employability skills and making sure there are strong partnerships with industry in the area. The next one of those priority four is a decreased emphasis on testing and an increased emphasis on soft skills. So making sure there's a lot of pressure for the state assessment, the MAP test, um, but looking at how do we make sure students actually can work on teams, can communicate, can problem solve, have those 21st century skills to be able to, to participate and be, be thriving members of the workforce. Um, and the final of those priority four um, is communication. So better increasing public relations, creating communication to parents about how they can best support their students, um, a strong request from parents in that capacity of how can I best support my kids? What are online tools and resources? What are supports that I need to be doing to best meet the needs of my student? Um, so all three of those, the, um, the career pathways, the decreased emphasis on testing, increased emphasis on soft skills, and the communication are ready round out, those round out our top six um, of the identified prioritized needs that 30% or more of the groups identified. And we want people to understand too, when you had all these focus group meetings, mm -hmm. they weren't 10, 15 minutes, oh, mm -hmm. you just coming in sign. I mean, it was a <laughs> lot of effort that these groups, because you broke them down into groups once mm -hmm. they got mm -hmm. into the meeting to define these. Talk about that process of hey, this, this really was something that we, we dove right into and we spent a lot of time with. Great. I really appreciate that process check-in. So we did, we hosted these meetings spanning from an hour and a half to two hours, and we talked about what it meant to be a district of innovation, and then we divided up into groups and challenged each group to come up with what they saw as the greatest needs for the district, and then to, as a cohort, identify their three to five greatest needs that they then presented to the full group. And then at the end of each of those meetings, I gave each person three post-it notes. So each person had, uh, had three votes to say, I think these are the three greatest needs that need to be prioritized first. All of the needs are valid. All of the needs are important. We, we captured all of the needs, but that level of prioritizing them um, is really important. So you see that reflected as we went through this process that there was a prioritization based on those groups. Now, we've identified the needs, and mm -hmm. we only got through six, mm -hmm. but there are a lot more, but these were the ones that really hit the community that they brought to the forefront for mm -hmm. us. So what's the next step in this process? Great question. So. 
first, if you are interested in learning more, the full PowerPoint from the presentation that was presented to the board on January 15th and then the community on January 22nd is online on the innovation page of the Tupelo Public School District website. So you can look at it, you can digest it, you can read more about the process, you can see the six needs that we shared um, as well as the seven that are also important um, but just received a little bit less votes in terms of the number of groups that shared them. Um, so really we're in the phase now where we are looking at these needs and researching and determining what innovative programs best meet these needs. Um, so that's where we are right now and really are looking forward to having another meeting later in the spring where we share out more of those as well as those programs, those initiatives, those staffing choices will all funnel into our student-based budgeting process. So we're really committed this year to being transparent about our budgeting and making decisions and allocating funds in alignment with this District of Innovation needs assessment. Stuart, you put a lot of time and hard work into this uh, <laughs> and it's phenomenal what we got, but we want people to understand we're using this mm -hmm. to make changes mm -hmm and the input from our community, we can't say thank you enough for mm -hmm. the people that participated. And they're going to see, the, you know, there, there's going to be fruit that comes out of this, mm -hmm. that, that we're making these strides, because we, mm -hmm. we can't sit still. You have to continue to move. And that's, again, it's about the children. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I just, I want to reiterate that, that thank you so much for being participants in this process, either as a stakeholder participant, as taking the survey, or, or now watching this video. Thank you for being interested in what the Tupelo Public School District is doing and learning more so that you can be a part of that work to best meet the needs of all kids. Um, and another just in, in kind of wrapping all of this up, as a part of this process, our goal right now is just to share the greatest needs. But we also did the legwork to ask as a part of the survey, what are the greatest strengths of the Tupelo Public School District? And we have a lot to be grateful for. Um, and if you look at the PowerPoint, we have included some excerpts from both um, community members, from parents, from faculty staff, and from students at Tupelo High School sharing out what they see as the greatest strengths. And when I look at those, I see a strong emphasis on the partnership with the community, on the quality of the staff, on on having innovation and making sure we're meeting the needs of all kids and, and on being committed to change. I think that that's really exciting to be a part of a community that feels like they're being heard and that hopefully this process helps to show that and that we would, my challenge or charge moving forward would be, we would love to increase in the future um, participation when we have community meetings, um, input on surveys or feedback, or, or just on a, on a smaller level, get involved with your local school that your student is attending or if you're a community member um, we share out lots of information on our website via social media um, I know that we have we're here at Joiner today and there's an event this week a disco ball there's there's always activities and things going on at the schools and we just love for you to be a part of our school district as the school district really is a true integral part of the community you speak, we listen. I mean, that's, it has to be a partnership. It can't just be the schools. It can't just be the parents. It has to be all of us together to make this the great district that it is. As you said, uh, we're at Joiner today. So thank you to Ms. Foster and her group for hosting us. And for your story, our purpose, one heartbeat, I'm Greg Ellis.